Hello, and welcome to my walkthrough series for Subnautica. Um, I'm just going to kind of provide some help with how to play through the game. A lot of tips and tricks and some stuff I wish I had known as a new player. Um, there will be some spoilers if you haven't played through it before, so just be aware of that. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to skip the intro video. I'll give you a chance to watch that on your own. First off, grab the med kit so that I can start fabricating a new one. Get food and water. And then we're going to pop right out of the escape pod and try and figure out where we're at in the shallows. The map of the shallows is the same every time. Um, your spawn location isn't crucial, especially once you get your first base up and running. It matters a lot more if you're a speedrunner. I'm going to put a link in the description um, to a video with a lot more detail on how to choose spawn locations. But the main thing to know is just as far as where you are in the world when you start, there are two of these coral tubes in the shallows and two geysers. Um, this is the southern one. Um, you'll note that it doesn't really come out above ground and the other end is the same. It comes out into an underground cave. The northern one has both ends exposed and the other end sticks out into what I would call the, the tooth zone. It's a little inlet into the shallows of kelp where some stalkers hang out and it's a really good place in the early game to harvest stalker teeth. People tend to call it the tooth zone. So this is a bit further south than I usually like to start. It's not too bad. Now you notice that patch of clouds there. We'll get more into that later, but that's actually a landmark you can use that is pretty much north-northeast. That is going to be southeast, the aurora is. All right, I think we're coming up on it now. Yeah, there's the northern coral tube. Now, for your first trip out of the copper is an essential component of all powered equipment. Uh, for your, your first trip out survival has just increased to unlikely of the life plausible. pod, you don't need to gather a ton of stuff. You pretty much just need one titanium and one copper before you go back. But this is this is the tooth zone I was telling you about. So landmark wise. Don't need much else. Now um, you swim about 30% faster on the surface um, up until you get the sea glide. It's much quicker to get places within the shallows before you're equipped with any of the good stuff if you swim this way. Um, so yeah, before you pop back into the life pod the first time, you just need at least one copper, at least one titanium, and I usually grab four of the acid mushrooms because you'll need a little bit more later. Kind of keep an eye out for any metal salvage you see laying around. Um, it helps. This is probably going to be your main source of titanium. Right here. And titanium is sort of your, your core building resource for most stuff. First trip, we just need to get oops, a battery, some acid mushroom at a copper, and a scanner. That's where that titanium you use. Um, the next thing we're going to go do is look for the sea glide because it makes a huge difference in how fast we get around. I also like to start off with a basic oxygen tank trip there. Alright. Let's go looking for sea glide fragments. Now you can theoretically find them anywhere in the shallows here. So you kind of have to keep an eye out, but there's a couple of relatively surefire places to find them, and one of the best is 
like I said, this is further south than I normally like to start. But one of the best places to grab that is is right out on the northwest corner of the shallows, beyond the the northern geyser. Okay, so there's the, the northern coral tube. On this trip, you're gonna want at least three copper. And these coral tubes are great places to gather stuff. At least four quartz. You can get a little more if you want, but it's not crucial. these creep vine seeds. And if you run into any of these sandstone uh, crops on the way, go ahead and grab those, because you're going to want at least one silver by the time you get back. Hello. Stalkers are a lot scarier sounding than they actually are. Mostly you just have to kind of move a little bit if you hear one. Life on this planet grows yeah. in so there's the, the northern geyser. See the steam's bias. coming out there. Study and just over this ridge, this is what I would call the sea glide wreck. And I'll also put a link in the description to kind of a map of the shallows area and the game in general. Um, it's an annotated map that a lot of speedrunners use, or at least starting out. Hmm. Looks like there's only one here. Okay, so there's a couple different places we can go from here. If there's only one sea glide here, you can follow the edge of the shallows down. There's another little wreck there where sometimes there's one. Or we can kind of cross slightly north over this little band of kelp here. You see there's a wreck there you can use as a landmark. We're looking for one of the life pods out here. There's a little shelf with a life pod on it. Yep, there it is. That is life pod 3. Okay. Ah. Quick chat about salvage types. There are four types of salvage. That is what we call a type 4. It does not have, basically doesn't have any yellow paint on it. Push that out. And it has that distinctive long piece there with a stripe on it. All of the other metal pieces, um, the stalkers will pick them up and carry them around, and there's about a 25% chance of them dropping a tooth whenever they pick one up. They won't drop any teeth with the type 4 salvage. So anytime you see type 4 salvage, pick that up because it'll make it that much easier when you're looking to harvest some stalker teeth later. This is the main reason I came out here right now because there's always this sea glide fragment here. Fragments are placed semi-randomly in each game. So you never know exactly where they're gonna be, but certain wrecks have certain fragments usually. You really think it'll carry two of us? Your regular sea glide tows a mass of 80 kilograms uh, at over 30 kilometers an hour. Which is the another thing that would be real helpful one early game. You think there's something out there that's faster? Acquired. Oh, sure. And that's assuming it doesn't overload three meters from the light. Okay. You're calm about this. I'm seeing the engineering problem. If I stop seeing the mats, I'll be terrified. So now we're going to head back home. I'm going to make one more stop on the way there just for convenience sake. I want to go ahead and make a compass on this trip, too. No. Yes. Yes, the compass, and... So we're going to be making the high-capacity O2 tank, compass, and the repair tool. That's what. Missed. So I'm actually going to need a bit more copper than what I was originally thinking. Radiation levels. Trend is consistent with damage to the Aurora's drive core sustained during Planet Fall. Alright, that's what I'm making for. Now, 
initially, your bases are going to be powered by solar panels. So you don't want to do like a ton of crafting at night, but as long as it's only a few items at once, not a big deal. Um, I'm actually going to drop. that and come back for later. Yeah. So those three sandstone nodules are always in this cave right off the deposits in the local cave systems. Sulfur is an essential component of the wind pool. Okay, that, ladies and gentlemen, is a crash fish. The instant you hear or see one come out of there, you've got to run. Especially before you have fins and a sea glide. Because if they blow up too close to you, they will kill you. Alright, I might have to wait one more trip for the compass, because I don't have enough silver. I'm going to grab him. Got a snack on the way back. You usually don't have to start worrying about food and water right away. Also, a tip if you hold down the shift key when you're in here in the crafting menu, it doesn't close the menu every time you click on something. If you don't hold the shift key, it does that. And then you have to read it, wait until it's done. If you're holding down the shift key, you can navigate throughout here while it's crafting and get your next selection ready. It's just a little bit more efficient. your effective exploration range. For your safety, please pack supplies for long journeys and stay within five kilometers of the nearest life pod or habitat. You should get, like to get right to the high capacity O2 tank pretty much as early as I reasonably can. To provide environment appropriate equipment using locally available materials. For your safety, this setting cannot be overridden. this because all the smoke is annoying it's not actually critical secondary systems online running full environment diagnostic and outputting results to data bank I also need a knife the fabricator cooks small organisms while disposing of the skeletal structure bodily fluids and internal organs thus rendering them safe for human consumption Weapons were removed radio. from standard survival blueprints following the massacre on Abraxas Prime. The knife remains the only exception. This is Aurora. A stress signal received. Rescue operation will be dispatched to your location in 9, 9, 9, 9, 9 hours. Continue to monitor for emergency transmissions from other life pods. Okay. Now, one thing I want to stress is that a lot of the stuff I'm going to do in this tutorial is the way I would prefer to play the game if I was doing a casual playthrough. There are a lot of different ways to go about things, so the way I may demonstrate for you isn't necessarily the only way. Just kind of be aware of that. So a lot of people don't even bother repairing the anything in here. Um, and don't repair, don't worry about the radio until they set up in their base. They 
can build a radio there. Um, in fact, speedrunners often don't repair anything in here. You don't even use the radio in a speedrun. So, you know, uh, it just depends on how you want to play it. That's one of the nice things about Subnautica is you can you have lots of options. This is Ozzy from the cafeteria. What the hell, guys? They didn't warn us this might happen. Our pod was almost crushed by the Seamoth Bay on the way down. Now we're hanging on the edge of a cave system, and this grim-looking snake thing's trying to eat through the hull. Come get us already. Signal location uploaded to PDA. Okay. So the next thing we're going to do is put together what we need for the Hat Builder. Because we're going to go ahead and get our base up and running first thing. So we're going to grab a couple of table coral, um, because we need some for the hat builder, and then we're going to need some to build a fabricator in the new base, which is one of the first things we're going to want to do. And we need some silver, and we're going to need have a little bit of gold in there, but I like to have at least three gold on hand before I build the base, um, and a little bit more copper. So. First off, I'm going to head back up to that northern coral tube. It's really one of my favorite places to get resources, and there's some additional spots along that trench there to get some um, sandstone, some tier 2 resources. Now, this is a spot I, you can go for a couple of additional sandstone outcrops. Um, there are some crash fish in there. So what you're going to want to do is make a quick trip through See the sea glide. You can just blow right past them. As long as you're moving, they can't really catch you. Where is that? There it is. Sneaky little side tunnel here. It's easy to miss. Yeah, might as well get a little bit more of this. We're going to want about five or six of those. About five or six of those quartz. We're going to start the base too because we've got to build solar panels, we've got to build a hatch, we're going to build some lockers. So, yeah, five or six of those. Basically, at this, on this trip, we can go ahead and just clean out this tube. Real quick, like if you're noticing that I'm breaking those outcrops really fast, um, it's another tip uh, that I highly recommend. Um, go into your key bindings. And if you go down for your use key, you can put in a secondary binding for scrolling up on the mouse wheel. Um, you don't want to scroll too fast. If you scroll too fast, it'll miss some of those and it'll actually take extra clicks to break. Um, but you also, that lets you break things a lot faster. You'll get a hang of the time. You'll get a hang of the timing fairly quick. Um, and then it's just one less thing to slow down your gameplay. Food's pretty easy to get. Water can be a little bit more of a challenge early on. Utilizing alien resources is a proven survival strategy. Now. I'm gonna grab one more sulfur here because I'm gonna need it for the laser cutter later. Oh, I already got that one. Okay, well, we'll get another one in another spot. I know. There's still plenty of good limestone in this cave here. Sometimes there's more than one crash fish in this cave. Like I said, it's semi-random. We've got enough... Oh, I got more quartz than I actually want there. In fact, I've got... Okay, actually I'm going to have to go drop some of that off. have all the silver and stuff that I need. So I'm going to go ahead and clear some inventory space.
blueprint required. that you'll kind of get a hang of the landmarks as you navigate around the shallows some more. There's the near end of that northern coral tube. Right next to it, in this trench here, it's another sneaky little cave where you can get some more quartz and some more sulfur. Lots of sandstone out in the grassy plains just outside the shallows, but you don't want to travel that far if you don't have to. Now I've got enough silver, I would like just one more gold. And just down the canyon from it, there are some more crash fish. won't be identified until you get them hatched in an alien containment unit, but that is what that is. You find those cute little round eggs growing in a cave full of uh, crash fish. That's, uh, that's what you're looking at. I don't usually collect eggs until much later. There's, it. There's three more in here. Now, especially early game, you're going to get way more lead than you really have a use for. get overloaded on them. It, there's uh, no law against dropping extras that you don't have storage space for. Construct habitats capable of withstanding extreme environmental conditions. Caution. Continued degradation of the Aurora's drive core may result in a quantum detonation. Continuing to monitor. Now that warning we just got about the Aurora's drive core is important for one reason. Um, from the... let's see the time it takes for the Aurora to actually explode um, is based on your time in game from the time you get that warning times five roughly so we've been in for about 24 minutes that means hmm, that doesn't seem right it's usually between 9 and 15 I think I missed the first warning anyway the first warning you get, times five, um, usually comes between like nine and 15 minutes. Um, so generally speaking, the Aurora will actually blow up after you've been in the game for about an hour. And that's important because it's something I'm gonna show you in a minute here, right after we get the base up and running. Which is gonna happen any time now. Uh, one other thing to note, when you're in here in the uh, fabricator menu, you can pin or unpin recipes by right-clicking on them in the Fabricator menu. You can also do that 
in the blueprint menu, but there's no particular reason to go in the blueprints if you're already in the fabricator menu. This is Life Pod 3, uploading our coordinates. We're plugging some holes in our emergency sea glide, so if we're late for the rendezvous, don't panic. Also, don't go home without us. Seriously. Three out. Signal location uploaded to PDA. <sighs> the, um, the Life Pod messages and the coordinates will come in over time. They have various triggers, like in some cases, um, they're triggered by building a sea glide or by building the hab builder. Um, and that was the one from Life Pod 3, which is where we got the compass um, blueprint and that extra piece of sea glide. Uh, so we can actually turn that one off. So we've already been there. Um, some of them are just triggered by the amount of time you've been in the game. There's the tooth zone there, and right over that way would be the coral tube. And here's the geyser, the northern geyser. This is where I prefer to make my base, <clears throat> because it's got ready access to a lot of resources. It's close to the grassy plains and some other places I want to go. It's not too far from the aurora. Um, okay. Now you can build your base. You have to build it within a certain distance from the seafloor, um, but you don't want to build it too deep, especially if you can use solar panels. Because solar panels efficiency depends on the time of day and the distance from the surface. If you build it too deep, they'll just be naturally less efficient. Power restored. All primary All systems right. online. Welcome aboard, Captain. You kind of have to plan for the future a little bit. Like, if you want to be able to put a window in, you don't want to block that location with fabricators and... and lockers and things like that. Now I like to build two fabricators because you can fabricate multiple things at once. That is ex completely optional. You definitely do not have to do that. Um, it's only once you get to a certain point in the game where you're nimble enough with the fabricator that that even makes sense. Oh. That's the other thing. Sometimes stuff you've added on can get in your own way. I'm going to put that... Are you serious right now? base starts with a fair bit of um, hull strength, but every time you add something, especially something glass, it reduces the total hull strength. If you get below zero, your base will flood, and then you'll have to you'll have to A, add more structural strength, and then B, repair the damage before it will unflood. Um, 
you can increase structural integrity by adding foundation pieces, bulkheads, and reinforcement. You can't really build reinforcement until you get lithium. Am I on a titanium? I am. But you can build... can build foundation pieces pretty much right away. Those gas pods are pretty harmless unless you stick around after they drop the gas pods, uh, in which case they are very not harmless. usually do is put lead and titanium and quartz in one and like gold and silver and stuff in another. I tend to keep gold and silver and copper together and I try to keep them right next to the fabricators because you do a lot of building with like oops, I already have that one there. Do a lot of building with uh, copper wire. But your organization scheme is up to you. A lot of people use the smaller wall lockers because you can label them. Um, these don't label, you just have to remember what you put where. Right now, I'm going to go build a foundation right here. I usually like to build it on a side that has a window because later on, I like to build. Later on, I like to build my grow beds right outside that window. Yeah, I'm gonna actually see if that gives you an extra two. I'm actually, I'm gonna. Thing that's really annoying about a suboptimal spawn location is that you do have to make a bit of a trip every time you go back to your life pod. But this is probably the last time I will be back here. Oh, 
as another radio message. You put two solar panels on the base initially. That should be enough for your power needs for pretty much whatever you're doing, um, at least up until you get a moon pool um, and the technology for a better reactor. One of the reasons I like to site my base close to this northern geyser is that uh, once I get the blueprints, I can put a thermal reactor down there, and then I pretty much don't have to worry about power requirements at this base um, unless I'm really going crazy. base. thing to show you before we close out this specific video. I'm going to pop down here, down this slope out of the shallows, to the grassy plains, and then cut left. Local scans show a nearby cave entrance, depth 90 meters, leading to an unknown environmental biome. There's an entrance to the jelly shroom caves over there that they're talking about. You don't want to do that yet. So what I want to show you right now... Oops. See more fragments. Not what I came over here to show you, but... Yeah, you don't want to spend a ton of time over here until you get your rebreather built, too. Short-range scans suggest this biome supports extensive biodiversity and connects to a number of small cave networks. Okay. Um, right here, it looks like there's stuff in the way. There is a collision gap there. You can get through there. Um, and inside here, you will find a variety of fragments. This wreck often has pieces of the battery charger. Um, pulsion cannon and laser chargers. Oh, and sometimes oh, laser cutters, and sometimes modification station fragments. All of which are really useful early game. Um, if you don't use that collision gap, you can't get in here until you get a laser cutter. Now, the reason it's important to get over here early is because once the aurora blows up, that gap closes. It's usually somewhere in the vicinity of the hour mark or shortly thereafter. And you do not want to be inside it without a laser cutter if it closes, because then you're stuck and you pretty much have to load your last safe. Or wait until you run out of air and respawn. Sometimes they'll fake you out and have a laser cutter fragment you can't scan there. vehicle bay. All kinds of great things in this wreck. Near blueprint acquired. Ah, here, upgrade console. Near I will need that acquired. once I get the moon pool gone. Should be enough Near to finish the battery acquired. charger. this time. Not pretty much everything. I don't recommend doing this necessarily without the high capacity tank, because you can run out of air, especially if you're not paying real close attention. When I'm 
I'm speed running. I don't usually come out here until I've already got a second tank. So you can stay in there about as long as you want. Uh, that's not what we're doing today. Looks like we're going to get the Seamoth fragments we need, too. And fire reactor. That's nice. Watch out for the sand sharks. They're noisy, but it's actually pretty hard to get hit by them. <laughs> you have to be trying to get hit. As long as you keep moving, most of the stuff around here won't hit you. Okay. Now this is the other part of the wreck. Oops, one sec. Yeah, I already got that. Uh, this is the other part of the wreck that we haven't been in yet. Um, let's scan some pots and some furniture. And sometimes there's additional fragments up here if you didn't get what you needed in the other part. Picture frame. Take screenshots and turn them into posters. That way. Laser cutter fragment we don't need. These doors with the handles on them can get open without any special tools. Um, and that laser, that door right there with the burn marks on it, it would take a laser to cutter to get through, and that would take us into the other section of the wreck where we just were. Cut it a little close on oxygen, I think. Okay. Now, one more thing with regard to oxygen. You can usually cut it closer than you think you can, because even once it gets to zero, you actually have three to five seconds once it starts to black out. Before you actually die. Alright, make sure I've got all the fragments I can, and then that's it for this video, guys. Um, we'll go ahead and continue next time with some Passing additional tips, and uh, I will see you in the next video. Thank you.